So last week we were in uproar. We were up in arms about the Ghanaian papa that married a 12-year-old girl. I want us all to remember that here in the United States, we have men using religion to get at children as well. Now, let's talk about this person. Polygamous sect leader pleads guilty in scheme to orchestrate se actual acts involving children. We need to protect children across the globe from these people. The leader of an offshoot polygamous sect near the Arizona-Utah border has pleaded guilty to conspiring to transport underage girls across state lines in what authorities say was a years-long scheme to orchestrate sexual acts involving children. Samuel Bateman also ple um, pleaded guilty on Monday in U.S. District Court in Phoenix to conspiring to commit kidnapping and a plan to free underage girls who have been taken into Arizona state custody. His plea agreement recommends a sentence of 20 to 50 years in prison, though one of his conviction, um, convictions carries a maximum sentence of life in prison. In pleading guilty, Bateman, 48, acknowledged taking underaged brides and having SEX activity with them in arranging group SEX, sometimes involving child brides. Miles Schneider, Bateman's attorney, didn't return a phone call and email seeking comment on the client's behalf because he knows that his client is out of pocket. Authorities say Bateman, a self-proclaimed prophet who had taken more than 20 wives, including 10 girls under the age of 18, created a sprawling network spanning at least four states as he tries, tried to start an offshoot of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which has historically been based in the neighboring communities of Colorado City, Arizona, and Hindale, Utah. He and his followers practice polygamy, a legacy of the early teachings of the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which abandoned the practice in 1890 and, strictly, and now strictly prohibits it. Bateman and his followers believe um, polygamy brings exaltation in heaven. Bateman was arrested in August 2022 by Arizona State Police in Flagstaff after someone spotted um, small fingers in a door gap in an enclosed trailer. Authorities found three girls between the ages of 11 and 14 in the trailer, which had a makeshift toilet, a sofa, campy chairs, and no ventilation. Bateman posted bond, but he was arrested again the next month and charged with obstructing justice in a federal investigation into whether children were being transported across state lines for sexual activity. At the time of the second arrest, authorities removed nine children from Bateman's home in Colorado City and placed them in foster care. Eight of the children later escaped, and the FBI alleged that three of Bateman's adult wives played a part in getting them out of Arizona. The girls were later found hundreds of miles away in Washington state in a vehicle driven by one of the adult wives. Bateman is accused of giving wives as gifts to his male followers and claiming to do so on the orders of the Heavenly Father. Investigators say Bateman traveled extensively between Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and Nebraska and had SEX with minor girls on a regular basis. Some of the se actual activity involving Bateman was recorded and transmitted across state lines via electronic devices. He is the second man to be convicted as part of the scheme. Businessman Maroney Johnson of Colorado City pleaded guilty last month to a charge of conspiring with Bateman to transport underage girls over state lines. Four of Bateman's wives all, um, also previously ple pleaded guilty to a charge of conspiracy to commit tampering with an official proceeding acknowledging they witnessed Bateman engage in se actual acts with his child brides and that they participated in the plot to kidnap eight girls from state custody. Charges also are pending against four other women identified as Bateman's wives and two of his male followers, both of whom are charged in using a means of interstate commerce to persuade or coerce a minor to engage in se actual activity, among other charges. The four women and two men have pled not guilty to the charges. The FBI said Bateman demanded that his followers confess publicly for any indiscretions and share those confessions widely. He claimed that punishments which range from timeout to public shaming and sexual activity came from the Lord. The federal law enforcement agency said authorities say Bateman instructed some of his male followers to engage in sex with some of Bateman's wives to atone for the men's purported sins against the sect.
Authorities said Johnson was pressured by Bateman to give up three of his wives as atonement because Johnson wasn't treating Bateman as a prophet. Two men charged in the case brought luxury vehicles for Bateman, authorities said. One bought Bateman two Bentleys, while another male co-defendant purchased a Range Rover for Bateman. Sentencing for Bateman is scheduled July 15th. Now, people, religion makes some people turn off their brains and get programmed by these people. And women and girls are not safe. Children are not safe. But people have an issue with me being anti-religious because it is turning off discernment, is turning off the need for a mother to protect her children. Like this should be a humane, like a like something that is connected to your humanity to want to protect your children. But instead, they are turning off their brains and allowing these people to say, this is from God, and they are believing them. I don't know. I don't know. It, I am, you guys go ahead, jump in with your comments, like, comment, share. Um, so I want to have this conversation. This article is about baby boomers not being able to retire, but I think that this is also another reason why um, people are not having babies, because I remember when I was younger, I actually stayed with my grandparents. Um, my parents were able to fill in the gap of needing childcare because I had grandparents and uncles that could watch me and fill in the gap. But these days, grandparents are having to work. Aunties and uncles have to work. Everybody has to work. So there is no fill in the gap because childcare is so expensive and scarce. So people have to keep working. Everybody has to keep working and babies won't get had. But like I said, this article is specifically about the baby boomers not being able to retire. As I read it, though, I was just sitting up here thinking this is precisely why people my age and younger won't be able to have kids because child care is scarce and grandparents or potential grandparents, they have to be at work because everything is so expensive. OK, but this article from Fortune, the new retirement is no re no retirement. Baby boomers are keeping jobs well into their 60s and 70s because they like going to work and also because people need the money. At 73, George Caveden could be spending his days on a golf course in Florida with his friends who have been long retired, but the New Hampshire resident would rather mentor younger co-workers and chat up clients than measure putts on a green. Caveden tr um, tried out retirement in his 50s and quickly discovered it wasn't for him. The flexibility was nice, but he was soon bored with spending his days puttering around the house and he and missed the camaraderie of a workplace. He likes to ski and golf, but could only spend so much time on those two hobbies. Plus, his wife and kids had their own routines, often leaving him alone. So he decided to pursue a second career, this time in a marketing, I'm sorry, in marketing at a small firm. He's been there for 18 years and has no intention of taking his foot off the gas anytime soon. Retirement to me is a scary thing. How much can you lay on the beach? For my per for my own personal mental health and well-being, I like being active and working. Caveden is part of a growing number of baby boomers, many of whom are college educated, who continue to work well past 65, not because they can't afford to retire, but simply because they love their work and won't give it up. I'm sorry, and don't want to give it up. In fact, the number of those who have continued to work past 65 has quadrupled since the 1980s, according to the Pew Research Center. Now, almost 20 percent of Americans 65 and older are employed, nearly double the share of those who are working 35 years ago. In total, there are around 11 million Americans 65 or older who are working to get today, accounting for 7 percent of wages and salaries paid by the U.S. employers. In 1987, they made up 2 percent. And as Pew Research also shows, for many of those older Americans, they work not just for the money, but like caved in for the camaraderie as well as the mental stimulation. I go on my vacations. I do what I want to do. He says, I get up in the morning and I have a place to go. That's what I like. I like going to work. That's cool. It is cool to be able to go to work because you like to go. Look at his smile. He looks like a nice older man.
A much higher portion of baby boomers have college degrees compared with generations before them and have worked less physically taxing jobs. The first generation of knowledge workers is contributing to a huge exponential shift in America's economy, says Mark Walton, a journalist and author of Unretired, which tells the story of Americans aged 60 to 80 who have opted out of leaving the workforce. The title refers to the accelerating trend in baby boomers retiring and then returning to the workforce. They are transforming professional and executive career trajectories and what they may look like for generations to come. In his book, Walton highlights the experiences of Americans over 60 who are still working high-stress jobs, including entrepreneurs and doctors at the renowned Mayo Clinic. Over and over, these workers told him they tried to retire, but they were bored or or began to feel as if they lacked purpose, a well-documented issue in retirement. Loneliness, an American epidemic, is even more common among retirees. The antidotes are backed up by research. Early on, Walton cites a study from two psychologists that looked at the experiences of 1,500 retirees and 400 people of the same age who are still working. The study found that around 44% of retirees were happy with their lives. The others, more than half of those surveyed, reported feeling some combination of loneliness, emptiness, and hopelessness. The more successful you've been, especially financially, the more likely you are to feel like a failure in retirement. What kind of person doesn't want to have money and be retired? Turns out there's a certain kind of person. They've been in careers. Um, they, I'm sorry, they're very curious and very competitive. As the U.S. grapples with what the future of work will look like, this group of baby boomers is claiming its stake, Walton says, and in the process, reshaping workplaces and societal expectations. Changing perceptions. At first blush, working longer might not seem like such a positive change. There is a pervasive fear among younger generations in the U.S. that they may never retire at all. Not because they're so passionate about work, but because they won't be able to afford it. Yes, I think that people my age and younger know that we're going to be working forever. The fear isn't completely unfounded. Gen X and younger will have different financial outcomes than baby boomers thanks to the decrease in pensions and a larger reliance on personal savings for retirement that started with Gen X and kicked into high gear with millennials and Gen Z. Articles and studies abound about the lack of savings and retirement preparedness in the U.S. Long-held perceptions of work also are changing among younger generations. While college-educated boomers may find much of their identity and purpose in their nine to five, that mindset is shifting. Walton acknowledges that America's retirement crisis is serious and sad. There is a significant portion of the population who can't afford to retire. And poverty among elderly Americans has been on the rise. But there is also a growing contingent who may who refuses to retire, even well past the age many workers have typically been considered less productive or valuable. To Walton, the latter trend is a refreshing change. Boomers are flipping the script on an ageist work culture that might have forced them out in the past, and still does in many cases. While more companies are recognizing they can provide invaluable experience and expertise and can mentor younger workers, that is empowering, he says, not cause for alarm. But if these older people are keeping these higher, if they have the higher tier of money, It means that the younger people are not getting paid as much. And it also contributes to why younger people will not have the money, the finances to be able to have babies or jumpstart or like build capital to be able to get a home or or many of the milestones that the boomers were able to do at younger ages. It also, to Walton, seems like an inevitable trend. Humans are living longer than ever and many uh, more have enjoyed long careers in offices, compared with the physically taxing work more common in the factories of previous generations. Though working longer doesn't appeal to everyone, it may be necessary in some cases. I've got decades ahead of me. A hard stop retirement there today, gone tomorrow, can be especially difficult for retirees to manage. Work takes up a significant portion of many people's lives. And after 40 plus years, making an abrupt switch to completely unstructured days without the built-in social interaction was hard on many people Walton interviewed for his book. More companies are rec- um, creating other options for older workers. So-called phased retirement allows workers to gradually reduce their hours, go part-time, or switch to contractor status. 
among other arrange arrangements. Workers maintain an income and get to keep doing the work they love, but more on their own terms. So I'm going to stop that there, but I would like to know what you think. Um, I have connected this with what is going on in the economy and the bigger picture. I really think that um, these people not retiring, some not wanting to retire, some not being able to retire is impacting everything. And the younger people, you know, my age who could have kids, how are we going to if the money is not there? I would like for um, you guys to weigh in. What do you think about all of this? Don't forget to like, comment, and share. Y'all remember how Katie Britt made a response to the State of the Union address talking about her and Wesley sitting around the kitchen table thinking about all those migrants coming across the border and harming people. She was in Alabama. This man happens to be in Alabama as well with this Alabama for Trump banner. Now, he must be one of those illegal migrants. Okay, let's get into this story. It says, Alabama Young Republicans County Vice Chairman and Senator Tom Butler's campaign chairman, Kyle Luter, has been arrested for se actual torture and unaliving. Totally sure that this is who Katie Britt and Wesley were talking about. Okay, this happened back in March. I'm just now hearing about it, so y'all gonna hear about it today too. Kyle Hayden Luter, 36, Butler's campaign chairman and former Madison County Young Republicans vice chairman has been charged with unaliving, se actual torture, SA using an inanimate object. I'm totally sure this is who Katie Britt was scared of coming across the border. I'm sure that Katie Britt and her husband, Wesley, this is who they were talking about. All right, so here's the article. Madison County um, unaliving suspect now facing SA charges. The Madison County Sheriff's Office said the body of 54-year-old Derek Franklin Walls was found inside of a home at 1790 Capshaw Road. Kyle Hayden Luter, 36, was arrested and charged with his with his unaliving. Now, a day after his arrest, Luder is now additionally charged with se actual torture and SA using an in inanimate object. At this time, it is unknown if these charges are related to the unaliving of walls. The Madison County Sheriff's is waiting to release the actual cause of death from the autopsy report. An uncle who lives nearby checked on walls on Thursday, but he didn't answer the door. The uncle then called the sheriff's office. Deputies responded and found Walls dead in the hallway. Walls' daughter, Shelby Thorson, launched a GoFundMe for funeral expenses. The family hopes to raise $5,000. My dad's life was taken from him in the middle of the night on March 6th. Due to this unexpected passing, nothing was in place to help with any funeral expenses. I would like to have a small service where everyone can get together in remembrance of my father, Luter is listed as a member of the Madison County Young Republicans, according to its website. Luter was also listed as a point of contact. He was also um, he also was a campaign chairman for State Senator Tom Butler. In a statement given to WAFF um, 48 on Friday, Butler said when Sheriff Kevin Turner called him yesterday about Luter's arrest, Butler said he was speechless and saddened for all the families involved. Here is Luder. It looks like this is K. Ivy. I think that's the Alabama governor. I'm not exactly sure. Deborah says another one is wild to see how many real se actual predators are in the MAGA party. Jim says, and here we see yet another example of hashtag not a drag queen. Yo, this person tagged Katie Britt um, saying thoughts. Look forward to your response. Um, this person says um, Senator Britt said to blame it on the Mexicans because she and Wesley are really sitting around the table thinking about what the migrants are doing. But these people, this person is right in her home state. I'm wondering if she is going to say anything. All right, you guys jump in the comments. Let me know what you think about this one. Had you heard about this? Like I said, this happened a month ago. So let me know in the comments if you've heard of this one. And I will segue into a completely unrelated story, the impact of anti-DEI legislation. Well, it does segue a little bit because it's another Republican situation. The Republicans are going hard against DEI. Across the country, conservative legislators have begun to target diversity programs in state agencies, schools, and private companies. At least 10 states have implemented restrictions on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Alabama, we did just hear Alabama. Alabama, Florida, Idaho, Indiana, North Carolina, North Dakota, Tennessee, 
Texas, Utah, and Wyoming. States that if you are a colored or part of the LGBTQ community, just avoid, or a woman, just avoid these places. Some of these policies ban state funds from being used for diversity programs, activities, and offices on college campuses as seen in Alabama. Some states like Texas ban diversity office at universities altogether. Florida's law also targets diversity training or programs in private workplaces. Legislators in at least 19 other states have proposed similar restrictions, although several efforts have failed to pass or were vetoed. So if you look, the orange, they were passed into law. Absolutely no diversity. We do not want diversity here. Absolutely diversity, never. And I really hope that Black students will stop with their athletic programs in these states. If they were going um, to Florida, Alabama, North Carolina, those states, just stay away. They do not want the coloreds. They do not want members of the LGBTQ community. And y'all know that these places are already hostile to women. DEI, as defined by professionals in the field, is intended to correct inequities within an organization. This could include implementing accessibility measures for people with disabilities, correcting discriminatory hiring practices, addressing gender and racial pay inequities, anti-bias training, and more. DEI practices have their roots in anti-discrimination legislat um, legislative movement of the 1960s when the Civil Rights Act and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act were born, according to past interviews with DEI professionals. Though, D though every DEI program may be different, professionals say they are aimed at addressing exclusionary practices concerning race, age, gender, SE actual orientation, veteran status, disability, economic class, and more. Anti-DEI efforts spark debate. The recent wave of efforts to target diversity programs seemingly began after the Supreme Court set, a, set new limits on affirmative action, a policy that allowed higher education institutions to use race as one factor among many in student admissions to address historical inequalities. Supporters of legislation led, I mean, set legislation against diversity problems claim they promote radical indoctrination that promotes division in our society. Okay. My administration has and will continue to value Alabama's rich diversity. Okay. <laughs> However, I refuse to allow a few bad actors on college campuses or wherever else for that matter to go under the acronym of DEI using taxpayer funds to push their liberal political movement counter to what the majority of Alabamians believe, said Senator, I mean, sorry, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey when signing an anti-DEI bill in March. Critics of the anti-DEI legislation, including national and state teachers unions and free speech advocacy groups, liken these laws to censorship and say they will halt progress addressing inequality. This is all about silencing students. United Faculty of Florida's Union President Andrew Gothard said in an interview with local news outlet WLRN. It's about silencing faculty. It's about withholding funding from individuals who have beliefs, speak ideas, or take actions that would disagree with the politics of the elected leaders. Education Secretary Miguel Cordona called the legislation targeting DEI very deliberate attempts to seek division in our schools. In a recent roundtable, according to the National Education Association, the largest labor union in the United States. This is Kate Ivey. I mean, Kate Ivey. We just saw her with that man, Luder, in a picture on social media. Impact of anti-DEI legislation. Since anti-DEI policies have been implemented, some universities, including University of Texas, the University of Florida, and the University of North Florida, have disbanded offices and programming related to diversity. I just did an article a couple of days ago about how Texas has laid off about 60 staff members because of this. The University of Texas discontinued programs and activities within the Division of Campus and Community Engagement and laid off employees in the DEI-related positions. The offices said it integrated access and belonging into the university's core mission and connected intellectual resources to communities across Texas and offer education to those who may face the most significant challenges in accessing. As a result, longstanding UT programs such as New Black Student Weekend, Aladente, Cultivision, I'm sorry, Cultivation, Latino Leadership Council, Native American and Indigenous Collective and Students for Equity and Diversity have all been shuttered, um, reported the Texas Observer this week.
Earlier this year, the University of North Florida closed its Office of Diversity and Inclusion, including the Women's um, Interfaith, Intercultural, and LGBTQ Centers to comply with the restrictions. So they're just shuttering things. I wonder how this is going to impact how people move if they stay with these um, these universities, if they leave them. I wonder, you know, if we're going to see an exodus from these states. Um, you guys go ahead, join in the conversation. Let me know what you think about these two stories. And don't forget to like, comment, and share.